Ever since I was a child, I uh, felt uh, sad and deeply affected by the injustices of the world. Wars, people perpetrating on each other, people taking other people's lands, and the uh, struggle that families had to go through to somehow survive through the insanity of it all. In the country I was born in, I remember that, unfortunately, hearing my parents talk in closed doors uh, that people didn't have political ex freedom of political expression. And when they did, unfortunately, they would be tortured. So I grew up thinking how wonderful it would be if there was this great revolution. Uh, bad people go away, good people come in. It would be that simple. When I was nine, uh, my family moved from Iran to the U.S., uh, to the land of the free. And here, my father was expressing himself more openly and talking with his friends about how nice it would be if the Shah was ousted and some form of democratic government was to take hold. And I remember anxiously waiting for that day. And then at 13, I was uh, pleasantly surprised where what seemed to be impossible happened. A revolution occurred. Uh, but unfortunately, I saw it also uh, go from what political instability to maybe worse, where not only people lost, still didn't have the freedom to express themselves politically, but they also lost the freedom to express themselves personally. So in my teens, I began to think that a quick revolution was not a good idea. And for, some, for things to take hold, for things to last, and to have predict, predictable and happy outcomes, maybe what you need are small changes, microscopic changes. And maybe through that type of a change, you could, you could get to a true revolution. So I thought to myself, what could I do? And I began. But I used to think that if you let injustice sit there, as I do today, that you have not only wasted a chance, but wasted a, ch a chance to a life. So I wanted to make a difference, and I started thinking about this, this concept of micro-fixing was born in my head. And I, didn't, I was only in my teens, I didn't have much else to do, so I began thinking, well, what could I do? So I started very small. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give it an unabashed, unshameful courtesy and kindness and show it to people. So I began to say hello to my friends, neighbors, strangers. In fact, um, in a very big college, uh, I was, I was all beginning to be known as the guy who says hello to everybody. And then I tried a different experiment. I said, you know what? I'm going to try my best not to say no to anything except drugs. <laughs> and when my friends asked me to help them with a paper, when they asked me to, to help them with a project, I'd say yes. In fact, I said yes so often that I got fired as a busboy because I was helping too many people. My boss wasn't happy that I should just focus on my busing. Now, maybe it was because it was a French restaurant, but needless to be said, there were efforts that, uh, that were not being appreciated everywhere I went. So, to me, this became the best way to fix these micro, these injustices long term. And I, I stumbled across my next micro fix. When I was 22 years old, I had just received my master's in electrical engineering. And a startup company approached me to build them a $100 pulse oximeter. So what is a pulse oximeter? Just for a moment, uh, pulse oximeter is the measurement of arterial oxygen saturation and pulse rate by shining light, red and infrared, through the tissue. And by looking at the change in the color of the blood, we can quantify that from 0 to 100% as arterial oxygen saturation. Well, 
two things happened that changed my life and perhaps helped me to have a bigger uh, effect, maybe a bigger microfix. The one thing is I have cold hands. And the startup company brought a commercial pulse oximeter and said to me, make something like this. As I was playing with it, and I was just touching the knobs and the buttons, my oxygen saturation fell to about 70%, which is alarmingly low. Now, false alarms in hospitals from pulse oximeters were between 70 to 90% of the time. It was crying wolf, constantly alarming. So I went to this group and I said, I can fix that. But they weren't interested. They said, we just want you to go make a $100 pulse oximeter. The next thing that happened, the startup company got some buyers for exit strategy of the company. And they approached me. They said they want me to become the president of the uh, acquired company. Wow, 22, 23, president. Sounded, sounded pretty nice. <laughs> and later I learned maybe it was just a little... Uh, inducement so that I wouldn't get in the way of their exit strategy because they had conveyed to the buyers that we were further along commercially than we really were. And I struggled with that. I remember for three days going back and forth, trying to decide what is the right thing to do here. I mean, these guys were successful men, the startup guys, or 50s and 60-year-old guys, and, you know, had nice cars and nice houses. I was 23. But I decided, no, uh, the morals of a company have to be the highest morals of the people running those companies. And they didn't like that either, so I decided to uh, leave and start what became maybe my next micro-revolution. With a $40,000 loan, a second mortgage on my condominium, I started Massimo. And we went after the motion artifact, and indeed we solved it. We dropped the false alarm rate from over 95% of the time, 90% of the time, to less than 5% of the time. And by doing that, we, by making a monitor that worked through motion and low perfusion, we created a clinically reliable pulse oximetry. And clinicians found cool applications for it. For instance, they found an application to reduce retinopathy of prematurity, which is a form of eye damage, that about 12% of babies were getting in the neonatal intensive care units. 12%. 2,000 a year were becoming blind from it. And clinicians learned to use our product to minimize the gyration of oxygen going up and down for these babies and virtually have eradicated retinopathy of prematurity. The second thing clinicians found to do with our product Critical congenital heart disease afflicts healthy newborns at a shocking rate of nearly 1%. And they would go home, and at home, what looked like a fever was a heart, serious heart condition. So clinicians found a way to use our device to detect and diagnose critical congenital heart disease. And now there's a low-cost way of doing it, and it's becoming a fast uh, worldwide uh, newborn screening standard. And for the adults and the audience and myself, there's stuff for the adults too. Clinicians have now learned to use our product on the post-surgical beds after surgery when people are being on opioids to stop people from dying in the bed when they were supposed to be going home. You'd think it would be an overnight success, but not so fast. The, the market was closed. You know, in this uh, free world, unfortunately, the market was not so free to us. And... We had a competitor that was a monopolist, and they were used to crushing competitors. Seeing us coming, they made an allegiance with an entity known as group purchasing organizations, or GPOs. Now, GPOs were put in place years ago, maybe 100 years ago, to bring the collective volume, bargaining power of multiple hospitals, by then maybe over 1,000, 2,000 hospitals, to negotiate for the lowest prices for the best products, but not so fast. <laughs> Government in 1987 gave them safe harbor from anti-kickback laws, and in 1987 allowed them to collect money from vendors, from suppliers like us. Well, not us, but at the time like us. <laughs> and soon, the vendors started paying 3%, sometimes over 10% of maybe 20, 30% of their revenues to these GPOs 
in order to buy exclusivity, to block competition. And you had three GPOs, four GPOs, controlling 90% of US hospitals. And now these GPOs were selling exclusivity instead of looking for the best product at the lowest prices. Well, we had to fix that, not just for us, but for patients. And we did. We began meeting with media. We began meeting with the Senate. We were able to make some good changes. Now, it's not done yet. It's not over. But not only we got on the ability to sell our products in the US, but many other small innovative companies did. And because of that, today, over 100 million patients around the world are positively affected by our pulse oximeter technology. Well, after solving the motion artifact problem and after making things a little bit easier for hospitals to choose the products they wanted, we thought we should go after things that, again, only we could do. People were dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. It's the biggest killer over the world. The biggest poison is carbon monoxide. Unfortunately, when people go to the hospital with s s carbon monoxide poisoning, it some, a lot of times it gets misdiagnosed for the fever, the flu, because the symptoms are similar. And they're sent back to the same places that's causing the poison. We had to fix that, and we did. We were able to make a non-invasive carbon monoxide monitor, and it's having a huge impact for patients, firefighters around the world. Next, we heard about how moms after delivery were bleeding to death, called postpartum hemorrhage. Patients, after their surgery in the recovery room and the ICUs, were bleeding to death. People misdiagnosed from, for anemia, whether it was due to malnutrition or it was due to some kind of bleeding inside from cancer or from ulcers, despite 400 million hemoglobin tests being done every year, just in US alone, invasive blood draws and tests, these were being missed. We had to fix that, and we did. We now have a continuous non-invasive hemoglobin monitor that has not only helped save lives, but it's actually helping minimize unnecessary blood transfusion. And blood in certain parts of the world can have 20% rates of disease being inside of them, from hepatitis B to HIV. And even if they don't have the disease, it's been shown to increase mortality and morbidity, even in the US, because you're getting old blood. So the cost and the mortality and morbidity of these are now being dramatically changed. After a huge intellectual property win from the monopolists, who also, by the way, took our technology, we work hard to preserve patent rights so that the equalizer for a small startup company with innovative ideas to be able to get to the market would not be lost. We created the, a foundation called a Foundation for Innovation, um, Ethics, and Competition in Healthcare. And we're funding ways to educate lawmakers about misaligned incentives in the healthcare system, or helping orphan uh, projects and orphan disease R&D investment. So we didn't stop there. We couldn't stop there. I know I'm running out of time, so I have to stop here soon. But I just want to mention one more thing. With micro-fixing, you start discovering other problems. Look, oil is one of the biggest problems we have. It's causing pollution. It's causing wars and injustice around the world. The biggest consumer of oil is, unfortunately, our automobiles. The cars we drive consume a lot of gas. If we could reduce that, and I know there's hybrid cars out there to do that, but let's just say some of them were not making the roads all that attractive. So I heard about a local company here that was making a beautiful car that was an innovative hybrid design, and I thought, I thought if I buy one of those, I could fix the problem. I, I, know, I believe Henrik Fisker is here today. And Henrik, your car is so beautiful. I get stopped all the time for people wanting to know what is it, how beautiful it is. I have a little glimpse of how potentially George Clooney feels. <laughs> so 
look, from a humbling experience, and by the way, I always wear the same suit. So for a humbling experience um, of using light and mathematics, uh, we are able to reach out to the hearts of people. If we want justice, if we want an end to war, people trampling on each other, we got to do these micro fixings one step at a time. If we do it, we might not only leave a legacy of a better, kinder world, but maybe a way for all of us to make things right by fixing the things near us, fixing the things we know how to fix, and having the courage to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you.